Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this event uh, organized uh, as a side event at the High Level Political Forum 2023. My name is Thanos Chenakopoulos. I'm the head of the information management section and Doug Hamaskell Library of the Department of Global Communications here in New York. And uh, I'm delighted to um, welcome all of you who will join us online. We have uh, quite a number of people that subscribe to attend this event. And I'm also delighted to welcome uh, our esteemed colleagues from across the globe who will join us today to talk about policy that makes practice, open science, and public funding for the public good. This event is more or less focusing on the challenges as well as the opportunities that open science is facing around the areas in the world that has been progressing, as well as the, an update on the current status of open science policies implementation. Together with us is our colleague from UNESCO, Dr. Anna Pesic, who is the one that has been coordinating the UNESCO recommendation in open science, and uh, I know they have some wonderful uh, initiatives to announce, uh, such as the, the Repository for Open Science Policies and uh, esteemed colleagues from across the globe uh, in the scholarly communications field and beyond. I wanted to uh, invite all of you to use the Q&A to share your questions. Um, usually when uh, we have been opening these events here at the the Hamaskal Library in New York in the coordination of our global UN Open Science Conferences with our colleagues in UNESCO and our colleagues from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs the Division of Sustainable Development Goals. I would always say the momentum is now great. That is the time to move forward. It is no longer a momentum. It is now a reality. At this very moment, there is uh, one very pioneering conference that takes place in Geneva between uh, NASA and CERN on all things open science, and we look forward to hear from them too. But to our event today, um, I would like us to start the event with an intergovernmental organization perspective, and specifically, specifically a perspective so from uh, our colleague in UNESCO. Um, a few words about Anna. Uh, Dr. Anna Persitz is the program specialist at the Section of Science, Technology, Innovation Policy at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. She is an ecologist by training with a master's in ecological sciences at the University of Padova, Italy, and a PhD in ecotoxicology at the University of Paris, South France. Dr. Anna Persis joined UNESCO in April 2006 as an assistant program specialist serving the UNESCO's uh, main and biosphere program within the Division of Ecological and Earth Sciences. Her work relates to strengthening the science policy interface and the promotion of science technology and innovation in the implementation of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda for a Better Planet. She coordinated, as I mentioned already, the development of the UNESCO recommendation on open science and is currently working towards its implementation. So to kick off this uh, discussion today, uh, I would like to invite Anna to start the conference. Anna, the, the event. Anna, the floor is, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thanos. And again, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today. It's, it's wonderful that with the uh, UN Dag Hammarskjöld Library, we now have this collaboration on open science uh, that is becoming quite regular. It is also great to see so many people connected again. We have like almost 200 participants. So it's great to see this interest and we do hope to continue um, having these conversations and these dialogues to promote open science, to hear from everybody what the different challenges and opportunities are so that we can really go in the right direction um, all together in the future. So um, I will start by sharing my screen and I hope that it will work. And I, I will just do a very quick introduction um, from the UN perspective, from UNESCO's perspective in particular, why are we interested in open science? 
we are interested in open science because it really is a tool that has a great potential to increase access to knowledge and also to increase um, the quality and efficiency of the entire scientific process. So with open science, we have science that is better, science that is, science that is more inclusive, science that is of better quality, and science that has a better impact and benefit in terms of the solutions it may provide for some of the challenges we are currently facing today. In this context, we also see to, um, open science as a tool for accelerating the achievement of SDGs. But maybe the most important thing is that we see it as a tool that can potentially fulfill, or at least advance in a considerable manner, the human right to science. So the right of everybody to benefit from scientific achievements and also to contribute to science. That is the reason why we, to be able to do um, open science, we also have to have an enabling policy environment. But policy environment is not the only thing that is needed. And I'm talking about policy environment because the, the, the focus of, of this particular conference today of the event. What is important to make open science happen is infrastructures. If we don't have appropriate infrastructures in place, it is impossible to do open science. So infrastructures to make it possible and to make it easy. It's also impo important to have capacities in place, to build capacities, both institutional capacities and personal human capacities to make it understand, understandable so that each and every actor involved in an open science ecosystem understands what the benefits are, what the challenges are, what their role is exactly. It is important to make it rewarding, so the incentives are incredibly important. And then policy comes in place to kind of make it required, but it does have to uh, include the policies need to include all of these other layers without which open science could not happen. And this change in particular in culture to transition to open science could not happen. So what that means at the international level and what it meant for us at UNESCO in the international level is that there was at a certain point a need also for a broader international policy and action framework. There was a need for a common definition of open science, a shared set of values and principles. There was a need, as I said, of this normative framework around open science, because we've seen in the couple of past decades how many new initiatives have been coming up from different open science actors in different parts of the world, from different disciplines. But again, something that would unify it all under the same umbrella, normative umbrella, was missing. Um, and that's why in UNESCO, UNESCO's member states tasked the organization to have a broad consultation with different actors to understand what open science is, what it means, and what enabling conditions it means. And that is how we come up with the recommendation on open science, the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which is a legal framework, an international legal framework for open science, which was negotiated by member states and adopted by the UNESCO General Conference, so all 193 member states um, at the General Conference in November 2021. As I said, it is important to have this global standard for open science that the different policies that are currently being um, uh, developed uh, again across the globe and across different communities and across different disciplines so that they can refer to something uh, that has been internationally agreed upon. Uh, we have uh, an internationally agreed definition, core values and guiding principles. This recommendation talks to different actors and recognize different actors of open science, which go beyond just the traditional scientific community. It recommends different actions, some innovative approaches, and it calls for a comprehensive monitoring framework. And in fact, the member states are required to come back to UNESCO every four years and, uh, and, and report on the progress that they have made. Hopefully, reporting on progress made will also include getting information from, again, the different actors that contribute to open science at the national level. I'm not going to go too much into details of the definition of open science that is in the recommendation. But I think the, the key point in the recommendation is to see open science as going beyond open access to the products of science, but to see open science really as a set of movements that 
increase scientific collaborations and sharing of information for the benefit both of science, scientists and society that makes multilingual scientific knowledge openly available for everybody. And it also opens up all the different processes uh, of scientific knowledge creation, evaluation, and communication. So it really is a cultural change that is needed from the traditional science in a way to um, this open science model. As I said, the different elements go beyond open access to publications. It includes, of course, open data, open educational resources, open source, open hardware, open source so software. But we are also talking about open science infrastructures, engagement with societal actors through citizen science or participatory science, and also an open dialogue with other knowledge systems. So the idea here really is to see science as something encompassing different also knowledges and how do we use that for the benefit of science and for the benefit of society as a whole. There is a range of different actions which are also mentioned in the recommendation. But I think what is the key point, point of the recommendation is that it really sets out the values and principles to which each and every open science practice should adhere. So we're talking about quality and integrity, collective benefit, equity and fairness. Without equity and fairness, open science cannot really flourish and diversity and inclusiveness as really important values for open science. So again, in the development of any open science policy, these values need to be taken into account. And actually the policies are there to operationalize these values, also using these principles, which is transparency, scrutiny, equality of opportunities, responsibility, flexibility, collaboration, and sustainability. So again, a lot of emphasis is on the values of open science and as, as a way of doing science, not necessarily as it is the case today on the outputs of, of science. Why is it important to have open science policies at different level, including at, at this level, at the international level? It is to show commitment to build stability or among the different communities that are involved in open science. It is also to enhance clarity, responsibilities, um, available budget that exists for the implementation also of the policy, to engage with the different actors that are involved in the open science ecos ecosystem, to acknowledge and remove barriers as they come along while we implement open science practices. So it is extremely important that we do have policies that are guiding our actions on open science and that those policies are in line with the, um, with the values and principles as they are described in the, in the UNESCO recommendation on open science. So in, in UNESCO, what we've done, done in the past couple of years um, since the adoption of the recommendation is that we set up like different working groups where we have experts and participants from different parts of the world, from different um, disciplines. And by the way, everybody is um, welcome to join these groups. They are open, they're ad hoc open working groups. We've um, focused these working groups on some of the key challenges of um, implementation of open science. So uh, policies, as, as an enabling environment, capacity building, infrastructures, monitoring and incentives and funding. And what we've tried to do in the working group so far is to provide some kind of tools through documents, briefs or fact sheets or guidelines on some of the, um, some of the processes that need to be put in place for open science to strive. Um, in the context of um, our policy working group, we've divided a guide for developing open science policies this is mainly thought of at the national level, but there is a lot of elements that can also be used for, um, for institutional level, for example. And we do encourage you to have a look at these different key factors that we have incorporated into this, um, into this guide, guide for policies. But again, what is key in thinking about these policies and also in implementing these policies really are the values that exist for open science and the associated principles. We have similarly done something for funding of open science and what needs to be taken into account when developing funding schemes or mechanisms for open science. 
And the emphasis there, I think, is that investment in open science does not necessarily have to be new investment. It's investment in science used differently. And the question here is how do we make all science open science eventually? I think that's the end goal is to, to have all science systems as open science systems. So just a few words on some of these key principles that would need to be integrated into open science policies is really integration. I think that's very important. It's to integrate um, the different elements of open science, as we were saying before, or if there is a policy on a specific element of open science, it has to be very clear that that is on that specific um, element that then has connections with the others. Clarity, comprehensiveness, very importantly, alignment with all the other existing policies. It is important to have this alignment with policies that treat some of the similar, similar issues or related issues, commitment to resources, removal of barriers, equity and inclusion have to be incorporated into these policies, um, flexibility, monitoring and evaluation. Again, more information can be found in the guide if you would be interested and I'll be happy to respond to the question. The, what we are currently doing is to map the existing open science policies. We're trying to do it first on the national level. Institutional level may come a little bit late, later on. And we are hoping to develop in the coming um, months, maybe a year maximum, a global depository, a repository of um, open science policies, which would be part of our already existing Global Observatory of Science Policy Instruments, Science Policies and Policy Instruments, GOSPIN of UNESCO. And we will also be receiving more and more information through the monitoring process for the recommendations, particularly on the existing open science policies. And the idea here is not necessarily to have a list of policies, is to try to understand what were the processes through which these policies were uh, developed how they were developed, what has been learned during these processes, as, and to also have a way, like a learning process between different countries while they are either developing their policies, while they're integrating principles of openness into existing policies, or while they're trying to review their systems, science systems, so that they include openness into these science systems. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I know there is a lot of other speakers. Uh, I'd be happy to respond to any other questions and also, uh, again, welcome you all to join UNESCO's efforts in the implementation of the recommendation. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, it is indeed uh, wonderful to hear that uh, there is so much progress on the open science front and the open science policies front. And uh, we do take note of the need for transparency and the need for equity and fairness. And that is very much aligned with uh, the grander discussion we've had in the last conference on open science that we worked on together. Uh, the importance of participatory science and bibliodiversity, as well as the notion that you know, open science is sort of like a little bit of a, of a wider umbrella. Uh, it is, of course, the, the scholarly communications ecosystem with access to scientific uh, research findings, but at the same time, uh, it is about uh, democratizing the record of science itself. And on that front, I'd like to now turn to our uh, next speaker, is Ms. Naniki Mahpakwane from the Botswana Open University. Uh, Naniki Mahpakwane is the director of the Lab Information Service at Botswana Open University. Her uh, career as a librarian spans over 40 years, where she served in various capacities at public secondary college and university libraries. In the current job, her most notable contribution is the transformation of the library from a predominant print to digital environment, enabling students and researchers in act to access the various library resources virtually in their locality. She is the chairperson of the Botswana Library Consortium and advocates for shared resources by using economies of scale in subscriptions, costs shared by over 50 uh, members of the cons consortium. She is an advocate of open access, open science, capacity building for the library and research community in Botswana and beyond. Naniki is also the country coordinator for electronic information for libraries and has set on its board and has sat, excuse me, on its board in the past. 
parole in this capacity is to advocate the electronic information for livage programs in the consortium and raise awareness of available opportunities for negotiated also processing charges and need resources fees. Uh, Naniki, uh, my colleagues tell me that you are indeed the line, so the floor is now yours, please. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Naniki Mapakwane. Um, I'm the director of library information services here at Botswana Open University. And like the previous speaker has just said, I also chair the Botswana Library Consortium uh, here in Botswana. Um, slide one, the order of slides. Um, that is the order of slides. Please don't get scared. Um, uh, just short, very short slides. But I'll have the introduction and give a background of Botswana, small background. Uh, and then um, our journey uh, uh, to open science policy implementation and adoption in Botswana. And then uh, some of those um, items are just, you know, uh, small steps that we, we undertook as we move into this, um, you know, exciting journey of introducing open science in Botswana. Slide two, the introduction. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to share the journey past and present and which Botswana is going through in the preparation to adapt and implement open science practices. In sharing, we look at the initial trials and initiatives and appreciate the key players that relentlessly pursued this journey. The, pres the presentation will put a microscope on the draft open science policy, key parts, mark my words, key parts, and conclude in showing where the footsteps are leading to. The next slide, please. Uh, this is as, um, um, about uh, Botswana. Botswana officially uh, is the Republic of Botswana. It's a landlocked country in Southern Africa. Botswana is topographically flat with approximately 70% 70, 70 of its territory being the Kalahari uh, mm -hmm. Desert. At its independence in, in 1966, the country was one of the poorest, least developed states in the world. And um, uh, with, uh, uh, however, the country's rapid economic growth in the mid 20, 20 2000 saw Botswana become an upper middle income economy state with a GDP of 60 US dollars to 4,000 US dollar per capita per year. And that's um, taken from the International Monetary Fund Report, uh, World Bank. The estimated population of Botswana from the 2022 population and housing census is 2.346.17 as compared to 2.024904 enumerated in 2011. One of uh, 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 the most beautiful and iconic natural area uh, as depicted by this uh, uh, picture is the Ogavango uh, Delta, which has been listed uh, as the 1000th World Heritage Site that was done in 21, uh, uh, June 2014. And that is my country, Botswana. Next slide um, uh, is the journey, Botswana journey to open science practices. Uh, as indicated um, earlier, Botswana got its independence in 1966, and its uh, miracle economic growth was based on its rich reserves of diamonds. Over time, the government has um, 
talked about diversifying and liberalizing its economy from its dependency on the mineral resources. And one of the ways uh, they came up is putting more emphasis on research and knowledge management for national development. From early 2018, the Botswana government set to build a knowledge workforce and relevance towards a knowledge-based economy through um, the reset agenda. This will enable Botswana to co compete effectively on a global platform with efficient knowledge value additions or chain values in place. At international level, Botswana is also obliged to meet the UNESCO resolution, uh, recommendations on open science, as well as meeting uh, the Millennium Development Goals and other you know, um, activities that they are ob obliged to, that they are signatory to. Um, we continue with the journey. Uh, in the past, several in initiatives were driven by uh, civil society, public institutions, research communities uh, that um, ignited the adoption, that wished to ignite the adoption of open science. Um, the list, these are the list of um, you know, institutions and the civil society that you know, participated in previous activities to, you know, to introduce or to advocate for op open science or open access. Um, the Botswana Library Consortium uh, since the year 2010 has been talking about open access and um, the op the Open Data Open Science Committee that was established in 2017. This was um, uh, established by collaboration between different stakeholders, being academics, public bodies, business communities, information professionals, librarians, research communities, um, with a view to develop an open data, open science policy that would enable data sharing and openness in science in Botswana. And um, uh, some of the local institutions like uh, University of Botswana, Botswana International University of Science and Technology, Botswana Open University had um, sporadic uh, activities uh, and they were uh, in the forefront of these initiatives. And of course, there were also research institutions and individual researchers who came you know, to participate in these initial stages. Uh, we had also international bodies and continental bodies that uh, supported uh, these in in initiatives, like the Electronic Information for Libraries, ISO, the World Bank, uh, the West African RANS, uh, through the LIPSES, providing expertise and sometimes funding. Um, the, the breakthrough came last year when um, a, a Botswana Open Science Symposium was held uh, as an offsite event of the Ubuntu Net 2022 conference on the 23rd of November 2022 that was held here in Khaborone uh, in Botswana. Uh, Wakren through Lipsense. Uh, uh, had uh, national open science roadmaps and they have assisted uh, a number of African countries listed there. And Botswana was its fourth iteration on that for that road, roadmap. And together with the Botswana op the Library Consortium, the Ministry of Communications, Knowledge and Technology, Botswana Research and Education Network, BOSREN, Ministry of Education, Ministry of State President, Botswana hosted a Botswana Open Science Symposium that led to the journey to develop open science and open data policies in Botswana. Um, governments uh, 
drive towards the development of uh, Botswana open science and open data policy is at an advanced stage. And of course, because we now have political will in terms of um, development of these policies, uh, we are very um, appreciative of the government's support in terms of uh, moving this agenda. So during the symposium, two working groups were formulated uh, and um, Botswana has um, adopted to separate the policies uh, to have Botswana open science policy and to have Botswana open data policy. Currently the policies as I have indicated are at develop, developmental, different developmental stages and uh, are going through the necessary national policy development processes. I'll zoom into the uh, open science, the draft open science policy, because it is in the draft format now and already with the relevant ministry and uh, talk about its uh, framework. Um, the vision for this policy uh, is that Botswana will be a knowledge-based economy driven by open science by 2036. And the mission is to advance uh, science and the wide dissemination of knowledge for the benefit of the research and society by adopting practices on open, reproducible and responsible research. Another mission is to provide a national framework for open science policy and practice that makes the research more efficient, effective and relevant for society and contributes to the reducing the digital, technological and knowledge device. Uh, lastly, the, another mission is to advance the principles of social justice through prom promoting a culture of open sharing, mentorship and skills development. And this um, is um, the framework is adopted by Botswana government through Smart Botswana. The other uh, areas uh, for the open science policy, uh, the focus areas, and some of the key focus areas of the policies are to promote a common understanding of open science, associated benefits and challenges, as well as diverse paths to open science, uh, to put in place an enabling policy environment for open science, including legislative initiatives where appropriate, to invest in open science infrastructures and services, to invest in human resource and capacity building for open access, and to provide promote innovative approaches for open science at different stages of the scientific process. And these uh, focus areas uh, are part of um, the open science policy. Uh, the next slide um, depicts the proposed open science institutional framework and um, um, that uh, depicts uh, from the top, um, is the cabinet and um, the parliament and um, the ministries that are, will be responsible for the implementation, the management, the coordination of their policies. And um, the appropriate departments that uh, the policies will be um, located at and on the right side, the governments, the, the proposed governance structure uh, within uh, the, the ministry that's responsible. And uh, at the bottom, the structures depict um, uh, a whole um, list of uh, key stakeholders that will make, that will uh, participate meaningfully in the implementation of, of the policy. And uh, key to those um, uh, at the bottom, we see that the libraries also take uh, critical positions and um, other non-governmental stakeholders. This is a proposed or draft 
open science institutional framework for open science policy. And the next slide on uh, coordination and collaborations. Um, uh, I think the, the institutional framework has uh, already indicated uh, um, who and where and who will do what. Uh, at the top here, I said the policy implementation and coordination uh, will be done through government, at government through the relevant ministry. And then the uh, government also has um, uh, already, you know, developed um, a, a digital competency framework uh, that has been modeled after the EU DigiCompet 2.0. And um, through this uh, competency, um, uh, digital competency framework, um, digital literacy implementation will be uh, undertaken. And um, it is hoped that uh, the academics and universities, libraries, colleges, individual and corporate partners, UNICEF, non-governmental organizations, uh, community leaders and international and regional uh, organization will be part of um, institutions that will partake in empowering the citizens uh, with necessary literacy skills to enable them to fully and effectively participate uh, in the open science practices. Uh, there will be also coordination in, uh, in terms of infrastructures. Uh, they, there's need for ICTs, there's need for repositories, there's need for a robust telecommunication networks. There's need for libraries that are working together to ensure that there are repositories and um, uh, access to information and knowledge. And there'll be knowledge centers, uh, government, Botswana, Botswana Library Services, Botswana Library Consortium and other libraries uh, will form part of the infrastructure that will ensure these effective networks uh, that will uh, let information through, go through the appropriate IC and telecommunications uh, networks. Um, as we go towards the end, um, we, 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 we of course um, acknowledge that um, there's need for funding to support the initiatives in regard to the implementation and adoption of open science. Uh, there is need for infrastructure, improved infrastructure that uh, I have already indicated in the previous slide. And of course, uh, the citizens and every participant need to have new skills in digital uh, literacy. And um, of course, um, we can see, and of course, when we introduce new change, uh, we, we are seeing and we uh, have uh, seen that there might be some resistance uh, to change in terms of the way um, we will be doing things. Then of course, um, sometimes to go through government, uh, it, it takes a lot of time for turnaround uh, for other, uh, you know, activities to take place. Uh, as I conclude, moving forward with the draft uh, policies, uh, there is need, we're going to be undertaking a legislative review. There's need for that. Um, that will align uh, with the open science policy and uh, the hosting ministry and the legal offices uh, will be doing that. There is also going to be need for to undertake stakeholder consultation and validation. Uh, maybe um, where all stakeholders can uh, converge in one place uh, to look at the, the drafts. There's also going to be a need for preparing submission for cabinet consideration and approval, and then prepare submission for parliament consideration and approval uh, for July legislative settings. 
if we can meet that just on time. In conclusion, um, the presentation has uh, tried to walk the audience in Botswana, uh, Botswana's journey towards the development of open science and open data policy. The two policies are currently at different development, developmental stages with the, open, with the draft open science policy ready to go through the validation process. The draft open data policy is almost done and should be ready to undergo the necessary process. Government has developed a draft digital competency framework with suggestions for critical stakeholders participation. And lastly, looking at the above, Botswana is at an advanced level in terms of open science, open data policies, preparatory activities. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, Ms. Naniki Mofakwane. This is really informative and insightful, and it's it's great to see that uh, you know the open data policy is. Uh, there and it's an important part of the open science policy and um, my understanding from just uh, witnessing your presentation today is that um, how open science actually works as a catalyst on several of the, of the implementation of several of the SDGs on a national level there's so many stakeholders that need to get involved and it's, it's really wonderful to see that this uh, is a sort of like a coordinated effort uh, in action um, I just want to remind our audiences to continue uh, entering the question in the in questions in the Q and A. We will address the questions uh, after we give the floor to all our esteemed uh, panelists today. So I will return to the questions after we hear from two more panelists, and it is now the time to um, give the floor to Dr. Mumita Koli from uh, the International Science Council and more. <laughs> so uh, Mumita has completed her PhD from the Technical University in Vienna, Teuvin, in Austria in 2010. Her area of expertise, expertise is the domain of synthetic organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry. She was the recipient of the best PhD thesis award from the Teuvin, uh, Hans Peter Winter Prize 2011, she was also awarded the Uni Invent Award from the Austrian Ministry of Science and Research. She continued at the postdoctoral level as a researcher in the Teuvin and at the Indian Institute of Science and investigated problems in the research field of metal and enzyme catalysis. Uh, Mumita then decided to explore teaching and joined the Indian Institute of Science as an instructor in chemistry while teaching. Uh, while teaching at the, at the Indian Institute of Science, she became very interested in the science policy research areas, such as open science, open source, track design, citizen science, research assessment, etc. She joins the Center for Policy Research of the, of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, as a postdoctoral researcher in 2020-2023, and pioneered the development of an open science research vertical space. Currently, she's working as a consultant with the International Science Council for the very important project, the future of scientific publishing, and remains a visiting scholar of the International Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Momita, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Thanos, and thank you for such an elaborate introduction. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Yeah, so I'm really honored to be invited in this virtual panel organized by the United Nations uh, Library and UNESCO. Uh, as uh, Thanos already mentioned, as a science policy researcher, I focus a lot on the issues of open science. And today, if you can see uh, the title of my presentation uh, is, is the tide turning in favor of universal and equitable open access? Um, I'm borrowing this uh, from one blog article I wrote on the International Science Council website two weeks back. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I hope my slides are moving. 
Uh, so uh, before yes. I expand, okay, thank you. Uh, before I expand over my optimism on this issue and the bottleneck in achieving this goal, uh, it's important for us to understand why scientific publishing is an essential element of science. Here, uh, the word science I use of not for a discipline, but broadly to refer to uh, the formalized approach to knowledge that is rational, logical, and scrutinized by the peers. Uh, now we all agree that science is a public good. It's not just collection of facts. It helps us solve many problems, and we need scientific intervention to achieve SDGs. And this scientific knowledge is conveyed through publication. So an efficient scientific publishing system is not merely a luxury, uh, it is necessity. Um, the pandemic has showed us that how important it is to have seamless and immediate access to authentic knowledge. Uh, but the current system is broken, it's inefficient, and we need reforms. In this regard, uh, the steering group of the, uh, of the Future of Scientific Publishing Project at International Science Council has done an extensive work. I will share the link of this work in, in the chat box soon after I finish with my presentation. But what I wanted to show this fragmented nature, if you see here the countries, the resource poor countries even of the global north like Germany, France, Netherlands, UK, all of their knowledge that they produce only about 40 to 50 percent are openly accessible. Uh, when we go to countries like lower middle income countries like Lin in, uh, India or an upper middle income country like China who are a global knowledge producer, but the, the knowledge that they produce only a fraction of them are accessible. To the, to the global community. Uh, whereas the Latin American countries like Brazil and Argentina features much better in this regard, as you see here, because they have community-led open access where authors don't have to pay to publish. I collected all this data from this Cutton Open Knowledge Initiative in May 2023. This is again another open science initiative. Now it shows us that how fragmented the global publishing network, but then I am showing this optimism in this, uh, in, in my recent article that time, the tide is turning in favor. It's because the community is right now way more aware, they're engaging in this discussion. For example, uh, after I wrote the article, uh, someone reposted this in the LinkedIn uh, and shared it that uh, the inequitable nature of article processing charges really hurting the researchers. And I would say it's not just inequitable, inequitable it is unsustainable as well. And then I saw a tweet on this article, uh, someone said that any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. Well, I would have to disagree here because I feel that right now, the even the scientific community overall is fragmented, but the voices are becoming more and more louder for a more equitable and efficient system. Uh, let's have a look. If you see that uh, in 2019, the editorial board of this journal, uh, Journal of Informatics has resigned and launched a rival journal uh, with MIT Press, which is called Quantitative Science Studies. And this new journal has an uh, article processing charge of 800, whereas the Journal of Informatics charges nearly 4,000 US dollar to publish a single paper. And QSS is a full open access journal, so anyone globally can access each and every article published in that, whereas Journal of Informatics is still a hybrid journal. That means who the authors who has the ability to pay this 4,000 USD, they would only be open access. The rest would be still behind the paywall. And in 2023, in 2023, we see more and more such incidences. So for example, this, uh, this uh, prestigious journals in neuroscience, the whole editorial board again resigned over the same issue of high article processing charge. And they are uh, expected to launch a new journal where the article processing charge would be at least would be half of this 3,450. And again, just a week, uh, just 5th July, the similar incident, again, editorial board resigned over these issues, and they started with a new uh, journal, this time in public health. All this 
community participations are giving us hope. And also, if you see this inequality in the system here, I put the uh, PhD stipend uh, of some of the global South countries like Brazil, Mexico. You would see here, these are the values, what uh, PhDs, monthly PhD stipend is in these countries, India, uh, South Africa. Now, I, I collected this data from this paper in QSS. This value shows you that these are like almost one fourth, one fifth of what the stipend they get, and they would have to pay so much when they want to publish a single paper in, in some of the uh, journals that are well known in their field. Um, I, I put a lot of uh, emphasis on to showing that how the high cost and inequality is hurting the whole global south and maybe to some extent many uh, less resourceful institutions is global not as well. But those are not the end of the story here. Uh, the lack of openness is a huge challenge is not in terms of when it's not in just terms of accessing the final version or the final paper, but the whole system need openness. So for example, as a researcher, when we submit to a journal, what we see that it's a binary decision uh, based on uh, the reviewer's comment. It's a yes or no. And if it is no, then we have to go to another journal and again, go through the same peer review. Now, the second time, the both the researchers and especially also the second time peer reviewer would have been so much helpful for them if the first time peer review report would have been in accessible to them. And maybe the authors has already worked on them. So the second can be really much more faster. So we really need a reform in the whole system. It's not just about cost anymore. And also the delays, as I just mentioned, if it is rejected with this binary process, we have to go for another journal to another and to next. It takes then months to years to publish a paper. And the inefficiency, for example, many of the journal then ask you each time when you submit to format according to their uh, 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 necessary requirement. And that's really unnecessary. We just have to keep on formatting. All this need to change. And then I would like to come to another huge problem that is problematic incentives. What do I mean by problematic incentives? Is that use of bibliometric data like number of pub, uh, publications, uh, journal impact factor, citation to measure the quality of the research. This is definitely a, also a global problem, not just for a global South, but many of the global South countries face much more challenge. One, because they focus a lot on the quantitative assessment, and secondly, many of these journal from the global north, which are indexed in Scopus and Wave of Science, uh, the science administrators in the global south expect their researchers to publish in there. But the researchers from these countries face a huge challenge. Uh, many a time it's told to them that the studies are too specific to a global south country, and uh, this is not the target audience for the journal. So overall, in the current system, we see so much of problems that we definitely need reforms. And of course, the final point is that uh, with so much of digital advancement in digital technology, we, the scientific publishing system has not been able to adopt them adequately. So I see that as a policy level, we really need to support nonprofit community-led models. Uh, in the International Science Council, the a steering group of the future of scientific uh, publishing project has worked extensive again on this topic, and they recommend peer-reviewed preprint as one of the potential solution. And why so? Because of course, uh, of because of this uh, rapid communication that the peer review the preprints have, it's freely available to everyone. There is no cost associated with it. And then most of these uh, articles are with non-restrictive licenses, and there is no third-party transfer of the copyright. And most importantly, this research that is out as a preprint, many of this gets peer-reviewed peer -reviewed comments. So it's already there to a verified knowledge. And currently, many of these peer-reviewed preprint servers are facilitating open peer review process. So overall. 
this has a huge potential. And then, of course, to mention it that uh, the peer-reviewed preprints are citable. It has a DOI. And if the researchers have submitted their data to a, a repository, they can link it to it. So we see really as the peer-reviewed preprint as one of the potential solution, of course. And we need right policy level intervention and infrastructure. And we also need the community to take part into reforming the system. And with this, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mumita. This is really, really interesting. And it sort of like sets the, the scene for the, the many challenges we face, uh, especially for, for us who are in the scholarly communications ecosystem. And uh, of course, for the scientific output. Um, and it also links very well back to the one of the outputs of the last UN conference, where it was more or less addressed by a colleague of yours from the International Science Council uh, about the issue of uh, peer review for science that uh, science itself faces at this moment. And then open science as sort of like an, an umbrella of practices does cover this uh, as well in the open peer review. But then I know that there's need, there needs to be more uh, exploration in the open peer review, right? Um, yeah. So, um, colleagues, uh, thank you very much also to attendees for the, for your questions. There are plenty of questions. I'm 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 trying to select as many as possible. But before <clears throat> before we go to that, before we go to the Q and A session, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, one colleague from. Uh, uh, Argentina, uh, Dr. Laura Rovelli, and um, this is the second time that uh, Dr. Rovelli um, is uh, uh, participating in one of the events that have been co-organized by the UN Dachamoska Library, and we are delighted to hear from the pioneering work that Clax is doing in, in, in South America. Um, I did not... Uh, avert my eyes, I did check and I saw that the two countries in South America have open access, achieved open access above 50% of the publication, just in the table shared by Dr. Munita very shortly. Um, I also recall that in one of our previous conferences, we had uh, a dedicated section only on the model, uh, that, uh, on the model of open science and open access to scholarly publishing that uh, South America has achieved. Um, in particular, Dr. Laura Rovelli uh, from the Latin American Forum for Research Assessment, Polek Clasco, is a political scientist uh, with a PhD in social science. She coordinates the Latin America Forum for Research Assessment, Polek, from the Latin American Council of Social Science, Claxo, Claxo, and is a member of the executive board of the San Francisco Declaration for Research Assessment, DORA. Um, and we do have high hopes for Dora as well. So Dr. Reveli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tano. Uh, I, I will see if I can share my screen. Well, first of all, it is a really a pleasure to participate in this session to, to, to share the, the recent trends in open science implementation from UNESCO, Claxo is participating in one of the working groups of UNESCO, and also to share with colleagues from the Global South and from a global perspective, uh, different trends, uh, opportunities, and challenges for open science in each of the region, and to join a common effort on, on that task. So I will use my 10 minutes to, to give uh, space for exchanges and comments, uh, my presentation uh, uh, tries to focus on recent developments of open science policies in Latin America and the Caribbean in the context of the of this uh, of this session. On the first part, I will uh, try to show a, a landscape of open science policies in our region. I will recover some of the points that were mentioned before. And in the second part of this of the session, I will focus on the challenges, opportunities, and some of the questions that guide uh, guided this uh, session. So first of all, regarding the landscape, 
well, uh, Latin in Latin the, Latin the landscape story of open science in our region, uh, we should say that, uh, as, as it was mentioned, there is um, a long tradition uh, of uh, open uh, access, uh, of open diamond access to scientific publication. And particularly, there is a conception of uh, knowledge as a common and public good. And this is not only um, an idea or a principle, uh, it is a practice because most of uh, the infrastructures and uh, databases and journal articles are settled in uh, the Latin American universities. So they are um, owned and they are governed by uh, communities of uh, academics in each of the institutions. So there is a 90% of adoption of open science in academic journals public in our region without APCs or outsourcing uh, to commercial publishers. It is uh, Latin America has the 25% of the global open access publishing. Uh, and as I said, uh, universities uh, are the leaders of this open access uh, movement particularly through different journals, platforms, uh, like uh, Latindex, Redalic, Amelica, Cielo, among some of them, and also different uh, open softwares uh, to uh, manage uh, articles uh, edition at universities, like the open journal systems. Um, besides, uh, there are plenty of institutional repositories uh, both at national uh, level and at institutional level, uh, which are uh, the national ones are federated in La Referencia, which is the network of networks of open access repositories, and which is uh, which subscribes also to CROAR. And this uh, really uh, gives uh, a boost to open science practices. So here I, I took, uh, regarding open science policies, I took um, a chart, a very good chart from the European Commission, uh, which was published in 2023, of the state of, um, of uh, open science and open access policies in Latin America. I just want to mention that in the decade of 2010, uh, there were many countries like Peru, Argentina, uh, Mexico, with, um, which establish open access uh, and open data uh, governmental policies. And in the last decade, and uh, we think with the boost of the UNESCO Open Science uh, Recommendation, uh, some other countries have established uh, open science and open access policies. Uh, that is the case of Colombia and uh, Chile. But we have several open science uh, mandates uh, at the level, at institutional levels, and for example, in the case of Brazil, at state of or federal level uh, within the country. Uh, here, I wanted to show uh, the number of uh, open journal uh, journals in the directory of open access. Uh, there are more than three. Uh, thousand uh, open uh, access journals uh, in in the region, and let me see if yes. And here we can see uh, the total number of um, uh, institutional repositories. We should say that Western Europe and North America account for nearly eighty five percent of the indexes open access repositories and open data repositories while Africa and Arab region account for less than two and 3% respectively. In the case of Latin uh, America, uh, there is 10.6% uh, of the total uh, open access repositories uh, in, in the door. So these are very good uh, trends all in all, but of course we have many challenges uh, with this uh, open access implementation uh, let me see if I can, yes, here. Uh, and the, the main principle which we identify or the main challenge which we identify from Polec has to do 
with the fact that many of these uh, open uh, access, diamond open access circuits is not well recognized uh, by uh, evaluation systems in the region. Yes, so that for us is, uh, is one of the big challenges to reform research assessments uh, among many others uh, to recognize this uh, publishing open diamond, uh, open access diamond circuit. One of the questions uh, of the panel uh, of the session was, uh, well, um, a central principle of the 2023 agenda is that no one le is, is less left behind in the open science movement. Well, from Claxo, we think that in order that no one is left behind, uh, we should focus uh, on policies at governmental and institutional level that promote open engagement of social actors and also the dialogue with other knowledge systems in our region. And the need also to uh, strengthen shared, interoperable, sustainable, federated infrastructures that support the existence by biodiversity and multilingualism of uh, knowledge in Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, as it was very well uh, accounted before, uh, we need to encourage scholarly communications oriented toward non-commercial and sustainable models based on collaborative and supportive work. Yes, because although Latin America has this long tradition of open access in many disciplinary communities all along the evaluation systems in the region still prevails as a measure of excellence the publication in mainstream circuits with uh, paywalls and APCs. So uh, regarding uh, 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 another question that was uh, uh, that was shared in this session was, well, uh, which are the breakthrough in for open science? And we think that in Latin America, uh, we have two main uh, breakthroughs. The first one is uh, to achieve data interoperability uh, in order to facilitate integrated access to metadata and to make uh, publications visible. This is one of the main challenges of the region. We have a, a big uh, or a wide fragmentation of different databases uh, for articles, for journals, and for the information, the, the scientific information of authors that is not well connected. There are recent efforts uh, by La Referencia in our region that have a uh, signed agreement with, uh, with different, uh, with Realic, for example, and uh, also, um, um, well, uh, with other um, scientific bases in order to start integrating that production and to provide with alternative indicators or alternative methodologies to assess institutions, um, projects, and careers. Uh, so consolidating indicators of indexed production of the more representative diversity of knowledge existing in the region is one of the main uh, challenges in our region. Uh, from CLACSO, the Latin American Council of Social Sciences, uh, we have worked a lot on reforming research assessment. We have also participated in the paper, The Future of uh, Research Evaluation from the ICISC, and we develop a declaration of principles to promote a common direction, common principles to change research assessment in alignment with open science and open uh, access, open diamond access in, in the region. There you can uh, then uh, see our declaration. But last, I would say that in order to promote from research assessment, open access and open data, uh, we need to encourage and regulate self archiving or uh, in open access with uh, creative common licenses in repositories of the region, recognize appropriately uh, the value of non-commercial open access publishing and the evaluation 
of uh, the, the content in repositories and diamond uh, journals. Today, uh, in uh, research assessment processes, uh, there is more recognition for those that evaluate for the mainstream or the so-called commercial mainstream circuit. So we need to change that. We also need to move forward towards more collaborative, collaborative and non-commercial systems for content evaluation in repositories, such as the initiative of COAR Notify Project, which seeks to link repository content with external open uh, peer review services, also reward the availability of open data sets. Uh, on open platforms uh, and uh, care and follow fair care and trust principles, incentivize the use of open data from other researchers through research assessment and also recognize the value and active participation of society and users in research processes. Latin America has a wide flourishing movement of social linkage, which is called extension, and also of citizen science. So this is not new for us, but we need to uh, better uh, reward and recognize those activities in academic and scientific circuits of research assessment. So um, the, the last uh, and ongoing regional initiative will be in October of this year, uh, the Global Summit of Diamond Open Access in Toluca, Mexico, which is supported by many uh, leading um, associations of, open, of global open access, like Redalic, UNESCO, uh, Science Europe, among others, and which is also supported by CLAS. So we expect there to discuss and to strengthen uh, this model and then, of course, open access and open science practices. And um, this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Rovelli. And um, again, um, I think Dora de Federation is, is a wonderful framework and um, the experience and the knowledge we developed from the three UN Open Science Conferences all point to one thing, re-engineer research assessment. I think without re-engineering the research assessment, we won't be able to achieve several of the practices of open science. And of course, the impact will be felt on the SDGs. It's not gonna be an impact only on open science because the SDGs are already at the point of peril as I'm reading in the latest report on the SDGs, the special edition that was released a couple of days ago. So um, I really do look forward and we are here to help with the raising awareness as much as possible and uh, implementing the Dora Declaration, it's really, really important that we revisit the research assessment framework employed uh, around the globe and uh, academia. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we're now moving to the, the last uh, panelist of the day, an esteemed colleague of mine, uh, our colleague uh, Meg Watsa from the United Nations, the Kamaskwa Library. Meg Watsa is the first scholarly communications officer in the whole of the United Nations Secretariat, and she recently joined our team. She's the coordinator of, of, coordinator of the Outreach and Community Engagement Unit of the section, um, which is actually the unit that uh, manages and coordinates the UN Open Science Conference, along with uh, several other colleagues from that unit. Uh, Meg is uh, committed to advancing equitable access to information and publics and systems through their dual roles in libraries and the Wikimedia movement. Most recently, they served as the University Scholarly Communications Librarian for the City University of New York, where they led open research initiatives across 25 colleges of 31 libraries. On nights and weekends, uh, Merck serves as the president of Wikimedia NYC and continues to serve this work as a volunteer editor. They have served on advisory boards of Library Information Science Scholarship Archive, uh, Wikimedia DC, CUNY, the City University of New York, Academic Commons, which is an open source social networking tool, and the International Open Access Week. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Meg. 
Thank you so much, Thanos, and to everyone for being here today. It's a thrill to see so many people engaging with policy development and open science, and it's an honor to speak alongside such esteemed panelists. As I listen to everyone's presentations, I think about a number of things. What does it mean to implement the UNESCO recommendations in policy? What is the role of libraries and librarians as stakeholders in policy development, open science, and science communications? Anna showed that wonderful pyramid demonstrating the relationships between policies, incentives, and infrastructure. Um, and the world's more than 2.5 million libraries are committed to providing access to reliable information. And as information stewards, librarians have the expertise and experience required to provide enhanced access to research now and in the future, including research made available as a result of open science policies. Now, we've increasingly seen the establishment of such policies by federal, national, and international entities. If research is funded by the public, the products of that research, and in many cases, its data, must be made available to that same public. And while some policies have been in place for over two decades, the critical importance of such policies was underscored by the COVID-19 global health emergency. Researchers and the people and systems that support the production and dissemination of their work removed long-standing barriers to scientific progress, including lengthy peer review processes, publisher paywalls, and in some cases, restrictive licensing policies. It, it was through wielding publicly accessible knowledge in service to a shared public interest, a shared global public good, that a vaccine was developed so rapidly and the World Health Organization was able to declare an end to the global health emergency in May, recognizing, of course, that COVID-19 is still very much with us. There are, of course, many open science success stories to tell. Um, open science policies and practices have impacted individual lives and entire fields of inquiry for decades. In the case of COVID-19, repositories served and continue to serve a critical role in advancing the pace of progress. They also preserve content for future use, which is imperative for a healthy information ecosystem. So if you'll entertain me, um, I have some, just like you to ask yourself some questions. Have you worn a mask to protect yourself or others from the spread of COVID-19, either because you were required to do so or because you chose to do so? When was the last time you wore a mask? The first. I'm willing to conjecture that everyone or almost everyone in this virtual room has worn a mask as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But how did you know to do so? Because of public health guidance, yes but public health guidance that was informed by collaboration between scientists, librarians, and libraries. When the COVID-19 pandemic entered the global stage, you, remember that, you may remember that there wasn't agreement on whether or not it was airborne. The medical literature distinguished between droplet and airborne transmission, drawing the line between droplets and aerosols at five microns. This, the five microns, was part of the medical canon, so much so that the source of this information was no longer you know, even cited within the literature, which meant that it couldn't be verified. For some scientists, including Dr. Lindsay Marr, this required further investigation. So they located earlier works in the medical literature, found a source citation and followed it all the way back to a book published in 1955, airborne contagion and air hygiene. This was a lead. But this was the early days of the pandemic. The physical spaces of libraries were closed. The book could not be borrowed. An online rare bookseller had a copy available for 500 US dollars, which was prohibitively expensive. But with the help of a librarian, Mar and her collaborators located a digitized copy of the book available through an online repository developed and maintained by libraries. From that book, they were able to trace a thread within the scientific, scientific literature, identify the source of the five micron error, and with the larger scientific community, use that information to change the understanding of aerosol transmission and associated public health guidance. So a work, a repository, a librarian, a team of scientists, a change. Open science was an accelerator of the COVID-19 recovery. 
and it is the mechanism through which the SDGs will be realized. In 2019, the Doug Hammer School Library convened a closed roundtable discussion on a global science commons to serve, and I quote, as the connective tissue interlinking platforms, policies, technologies, and social infrastructures, all critical layers of open science, each of which is necessary, but none of which is sufficient on its own. Whether organized around a discipline, an institution, a funder, a geographic region, research repositories are the platforms through which open science circulates. So how do we encapsulate open repositories into open science policies? How do we ensure they serve as infrastructure in service to open science and the public good? A part of this is about resources. There is a history of private and public entities funding the dissemination of research through the payment of article processing charges. And much as open access policies have supported implementation through the payment of APCs, I would ask, can open science policies support implementation through resourcing a network of repositories and the labor required to support them? A number of open science policies include requirements for distributing one's research products in a trusted repository that adheres to a set of best practices and policies established by the funder. There could be and are entire conferences devoted to repository standards and infrastructure, and it is imperative that policy, policymakers work with information professionals, with librarians, to develop these standards to advance interoperability. It's imperative that a wider range of entities, whether individual libraries or regional consortia, are resourced to steward repositories that meet these standards and to lead the development of open software solutions that can be used by a wider range of institutions, removing some of the technical and resource barriers that exist today. Alongside the technical infrastructure, the legal or licensing infrastructure underneath repositories must ensure the ability to access and build upon scientific discoveries now and in the future. Speakers at the UN Open Science Conferences have warned against the commercial monopolization of research, and this monopolization extends to repository infrastructure as well, whether it's the technical infrastructure at the platform or the copyright and licensing agreements attached to the research products on that platform. It was interesting to see, for instance, some new licensing language appear on PubMed Central Records during the PubMed during the pandemic, uh, PubMed Central being a repository run by the US National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. A commercial publisher provided, and I believe still provides, full access to the research it publishes on COVID-19 via PubMed Central. But according to the records attached to each of these outputs, this license ends when the WHO declares the public health emergency over. That happened, and very quickly the records were updated to reflect that the license will end when the copyright holder, the commercial publisher, decides to end it. Raising questions about long-term access to those works, the sustainability of such partners, and whether profit-driven inter profit interests can exist alongside open science principles and practices. How do we make sure repositories are incorporating and implementing the same approach to equity advanced by the UNESCO recommendations? How can repositories, and here I'm quoting directly from the recommendations, ensure equity among researchers from developed and developing countries, enable fair and reciprocal sharing of scientific inputs and outputs, and equal access to scientific knowledge to both producers and consumers of knowledge regardless of location, nationality, race, age, gender, income, socioeconomic circumstances, career stage, discipline, language, religion, disability, ethnicity, or migratory status, or any other grounds. How can repositories connect to the scholarly record without replicating the inequities that are present within that record? Multilingualism is a founding principle and core value of the United Nations, and the UNESCO re recommendations encourage multilingualism in the practice of science, in scientific publications and academic communications. But the scholarly record is largely in English and described using metadata, subject headings and keywords in English. So yes, how can incentives shift to value open science processes instead of high-ranking journals dominantly published in English? But also, how can repositories support the description and discovery of scientific outputs authored in a wider range of languages by a wider range of researchers, including citizen scientists? 
Where and when is it appropriate to translate content? Through what mechanisms? What does repository interoperability look like in a global multilingual context? And so as policies are developed on national and international levels, how do we advance a global science commons? That connective tissue interlinking platforms, policies, technologies, and social infrastructures. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague Thanos um, to bring us into the Q&A. Thank you very much, Meg, and um, uh, a personal thanks for, for uh, uh, focusing on, on the, repositories, the repositories and the importance of the repositories as, as, uh, as vehicles and, and infrastructures for uh, open science implementation. Um, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, all our attendees, if it's possible, to stay with us for a uh, a uh, few more minutes for another 20 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, so we can go through some of the many questions that uh, we have received in the Q&A. And I also want to uh, thank our panelists for their understanding. Uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, speakers and panelists, and I did not want to uh, start uh, asking them to go faster because I, this is something that sort of like affects our trail of thinking. Um, but I think now is the time, colleagues, to and attendees and, and everyone to send as many questions as you have. And we will make sure to address, pass some of the questions that we will not address today in this uh, 20 minutes QA by our panelists. Uh, I have here um, a couple of comments uh, and questions. I would like to start uh, with a question and probably address this question to you, Anna. Um, there is a um, nice uh, talk and on the open science recommendation and there's a thank you for that um, it is so important to have a global approach this is the understanding i see go spin as getting <clears throat> or mapping science into policy across the board getting open science into science policy is good but it is uh, a more or level how do we evaluate the benefits of open science to science policy interfaces across the board this question comes from our colleague Patrick Paul from the SDG Academy. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the question. So um, we've been working for some time now on the benefits of open science for science and also benefits of open science beyond science. So looking uh, at what open science can also bring to communities who are beyond the traditional scientific community. I think we now have some understanding of the way that working more openly actually increases the quality. It also reduces the, the reproducibility as well. Trans it increases transparency as well. And with that also the, the, the kind of the, the peer review uh, uh, by, the, by the scientific community as well. Um, there of course is indications that better collaborations and access to already existing um, data will also be beneficial in terms of economic benefits because there will be more synergies, there will be less duplications of efforts, there will be more ways of doing things together um, and, and advancing um, in kind of a shared way um, as well. Uh, we've also now seen more and more um, uh, institutions moving towards open science because this collaborative way of working attracts talent. So instead of losing talent from academia, from traditional, you know, um, uh, publicly paid, pu pu publicly funded um, research institutions who are starting to leave these institutions because of the rigidity sometimes of the system, the rigidity in which the careers are evaluated, etc they're getting more and more um, attracted by working in Googles and other types of different um, uh, uh, institutions or, or, or industries, private sector, because it gives them more freedom also. It gives them more leverage to collaborate. It gives them more tools for collaboration, et cetera. So we see more and more open science really, particularly as a tool to attract young, good people in academia and in, um, and in research institutions. So there is a lot of different ways in which one can evaluate the impacts of open science. We are still working on it. We're still working on like a very neat table of all the different benefits, some, you know, statistical data on that, including, uh, you know, economic benefits. 
uh, but it is there and and we do realize more and more that open science is also the way of doing science in the 21st century you have a population that is ready to collaborate that is ready to work together you have infrastructures that are there that can be adapted for these kinds of things and that would also contribute to disciplines working across um, um, with with each other which is fundamental for solving the issues that we need to solve today including with working with um, other knowledge holders such indigenous peoples or, or community or other communities citizen science etc so there is a lot of different ways in which open science and inclusion of openness in the existing science policies can actually benefit both science but also can be beneficial in terms of economic and social benefits that that can bring to the institutions and nations that are bringing openness into their policies so i'm not sure if i completely responded to the question but this is a little bit where where, where we see the benefits of the integration of openness in, in science policy I, th I think you did Anna thank you very much and um, uh, if uh, Paul is still on the on the conference I'm, I'm sure he will send a follow-up question in the chat um, I wanted to I, there are some questions that are directly to specific panelists and some that are for all of you so I'll just go directly to the ones that are for specific panelists so um, I wanted to uh, uh, bring here a question. I don't have information of the names of entities for all, so I won't refer to names of entities for all the questions, only for the ones that I managed to copy paste in your box. So there is a question for Dr. Ravelli. Um, first of all, uh, if I'm allowed to make a small comment, uh, Dr. Ravelli, about uh, the, the Latin American model of open access. Uh, in our last conference, we had um, uh, the executive director of uh, Retalic as a keynote speaker. Uh, it was really awe-inspiring the fact that we had that open access is in the Mex in the constitution of Mexico. So it is a it's a clause a clause in the constitution. I think this sort of like denotes some differences in approaches. But for the specific questions, the the question here is. Can, can you talk about how open science policies can influence policymakers to invest in producing publications in multiple languages? Uh, for example, in the US, Spanish is the second most spoken language, yet there are not that many general publications that are translated to Spanish. So I know that um, um, you're more or less uh, representing Spanish uh, speaking nations. However, we heard again in the last conference, you know, this. A great amount of languages in this, of course, the Portuguese regions and so on. So over to you, Dr. Ren. Well, thank you very much for, for this interesting question and for recovering the, the presentation. I, I think it's from Ariana Ariana Mesarril from Realic on the yeah. yes, on the open diamond access uh, model in Latin America. Well, regarding multilingualism, we should say that first of all, this open diamond model reflects very well, at least the, the Portuguese and Spanish uh, languages uh, in the region. Most of the, the journals are uh, disseminated in these languages. But regarding its promotion from research uh, assessment practices and incentives, uh, well, there are some uh, advices from the declaration of, of Collect to include in journals at least a percent of uh, different languages, yes, uh, for example, native languages or uh, less, um, or languages like Spanish, Portuguese, or, and others that are not well represented in the commercial uh, uh, international databases. So the idea is to include Yes, a percent of publications in the in the journals to reflect this diversity and also encourage researchers to produce at least uh, from its complete production at least uh, an amount a percent one paper per year or two years that that depends on on the funder where the there is a, an explicit recognition uh, to publishing in native or local languages. Uh, so there are many incentives that from research assessment could be introduced uh, to promote, to recognize uh, the, the language diversity 
Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, this is uh, directly uh, related with the fact that many of the users of open uh, access diamond model are students, yes? So, uh, and are communities with problems uh, that need uh, more information. So it is fundamental that uh, that diversity of languages is reflected in journals and articles to read communities, to read students um, and contribute to, to, language, to knowledge dissemination. Thank you, Dr. Rovelli. I think this is cover some of the aspects as well as perhaps uh, having funders um, stipulate that in uh, the proposals that they received that they would like to see some results in. So it's sort of like a little bit of a, of a policy making at the institutional level that could also perhaps be helpful on that front. Moving on to, to, um, to the next question, which is for Dr. Uh, Dr. Mumita. It's, it's I, think, I think a simple question. In India, Dr. Mumita, what is uh, the position of open science and how can youth of India contribute in uh, changing that position if it needs to be changed? Yeah, of course, this need to be changed. So for example, uh, we had a draft open science policy sitting from 2020, 2020, I mean, it's a part of our science and technology policy draft, one chapter, but still we have not seen it's being implemented or, or at least being formally announced as a policy. So that of course has to be changed to a formal policy. And then, of, and also we understand that it cannot just always be top driven. There's, as the question also mentioned, that how the young researchers can participate. So for that also, we are taking uh, various action. One of this that last year we did an open science conference. And of course, that was free. Everyone, it was, uh, it was a online and of course it was free everybody could attend uh, they could also also similarly we did a, a ideathon competition for young researchers to give their ideas on how open science can be implemented then the next thing also right now uh, we did one uh, event on preprint how researchers can use preprints with the indian young uh, academy of science national academy of science uh, and again, we would have one more webinar just next week, which we are organizing with our library, with the data, data site on how, and we are planning to have some data repositories and how digital identifiers can be used and how, of course, the scientists and the researchers and the young scientists can use such infrastructure for their benefit. So these are things happening. What is that we probably have to convey to a much broader audience that these are happening? Please take part. Yeah, that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mumita. Um, and now to one question for Ms. Naniki Mapapwane. Um, the question is, um, first of all, there's a, a, a heartfelt thank you for your presentation. Uh, the question is, does Botswana have science and technology partnerships with the regional neighboring countries? Who are Botswana's main science and technology partners? What's the last part of the question? Who are Botswana's main science and technology partners in the uh, open science policy drafting? Um, the West African and Central uh, Research and Education Network through LEPSES are the ones who partnered with the Botswana government and the stakeholders that were involved in the organization of the Botswana Open Science uh, Symposium that was held um, uh, last year. And then secondly, through um, Botswana uh, Research and Education Networks, Botswana is part of the Ubuntu Net, and therefore uh, we are sharing uh, costs in terms of uh, upscaling the telecommunications and ICTs to ensure free flow of uh, research data and research output in the region and across uh, Africa where there are NRENs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this response. Uh, and finally, um, I'd like to offer uh, one last question for all of you. Um, 
I'm from one of the developing countries in the Asia region. Developing the policy is quite challenging, especially for the new things such as open research data. Sometimes it's challenging to advocate the higher level, such as university management, uh, government officials, entities, and so on. Could you share your main lessons your, from your experience in advocacy to indicate the need for development of an open science policy? I think this is, this is a wonderful question because it more or less is the first step when you start to start, when you need to start talking with people at higher level who have, I'm afraid to say, sometimes um, uh, not a full understanding or a grand understanding of open science and its practices. So the idea is, what are the first steps? How do we advocate? How do I reach people in government, in, in senior university management, and so on? Who would like to go first? I can, I can go first, because mine is a, it's an easy answer. Please. Uh, you have the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Your, your, your country has adopted it uh, very, very possibly. Uh, so it is a, a, a global um, international framework that they are going to, that the country is going to have to report on. They, they will have to report on the progress made. They will have to respond on all the different uh, recommendations and actions which are inside the recommendation. So it is a relatively um, easy way to try to advocate for some kind of developments um, on open science within your um, in institution. Uh, it's, it's an easy answer, but not necessarily the most effective one. So I will leave the other speakers to speak to other ways of advocating as well. Thank you, Anna. Um, who would like to go next? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, I realized that, um, you know, um, you can uh, do a lot of advocacy for these uh, new uh, developments, but when the environment is not conducive yet, especially at government level, you know, it is very difficult. And um, secondly, there has to be some political will. Like in our case, the president is driving the research agenda and the, the movement towards a knowledge-based economy. Therefore, this project has been driven from the office of the president. And uh, now it goes very smoothly, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mamita? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, one of the thing, definitely the, the the answer that just now we got from Botswana, that's of course that we need the senior uh, political leadership to align with it. But then more importantly, also, it's, it's, it's not just, it's not always top driven in a democratic countries. It's more about that how the community behaves. So it's very important to make the community aware of the new development and try to uh, try to spread the news. And another thing that I would like to mention is to collaborate with various regions uh, on this issue. So for example, we had a joint project with Folek, with Laura. We worked on the research assessment issues on, uh, on the South Asia perspective. We did the research on how it happens in South Africa, South, a South Asia. And then there was the collaborative report from Folek and us that what are the different regional differences and what we can adopt together, what are the advantages. So this kind of collaboration with various regions also helps a lot to bring this perspective to your own region where in another region it's working quite good. So that's how I would see that uh, steps. Thank you very much. Dr. Ravelli? Yes, thank you. Well, I agree with all the, the statements and positions. I would like to emphasize that in a region like Latin America, where research is mostly funded by uh, governments, uh, there is, uh, it is unbelievable that uh, then the society has no access to the production that was uh, funded by its own government. So I think that many of the states in the region have, underst have understood the, that, uh, that situation. That's why they have 
move forward towards different regulations of open access and open science. And it, this has to do also with the sovereignty of our data. Yes, it has to do with uh, the fact that the state can uh, have some uh, margin of autonomy uh, and sovereignty in the information that is produced and funded by the states. So I would say that, uh, of course, following the rule uh, of UNESCO, that as open as is possible, as close as is needed, yes, because in some cases, some information should be uh, should be kept uh, uh, more um, less open. But with this in mind, I think that open is the, the, the road for collaboration, for better science and uh, for collective benefit. And last, uh, one of the questions of this session was, uh, how to uh, mitigate the spread of misinformation or disinformation. Well, I think that one of the points for that is the engagement of society in the production of knowledge. Yeah? So that they see, they participate, they know how it's produced and they have more tools uh, for uh, to identify misinformation and this contributes with more democratic societies. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this uh, comment, Dr. Rebelli. And finally, Meg, with your many years of, uh, of advocacy, any suggestion, just one minute? Yes, um, and oh, hard to go after uh, such wonderful responses to this question. Um, I would say that you know, for an individual or an institution that is new to open access, new to open science, it can often feel like something outside as other in addition to all of the work that is already happening. But in reality, it is very much a pragmatic solution to the problems that we face. So to identify the needs of the institution, um, of the organization, and then align it with the work of open science, right? To present it as a solution to the problems that we face. Um, uh, and to recognize that that process will may be an iterative one. Uh, perhaps you first open one collection um, and then another on your path um, to an open science policy. Um, so thank you. Wonderful, that's a, that's a wonderful note that this process can be an iterative one. So it's, you know, we do not change the universe in one week, but definitely we can start. So uh, with this uh, tone and um, a reminiscent of the, of the ending of the last event we did uh, in the STI, during the STI forum with the Maxim Ubuntu for Open Science. I wanna repeat that Maxim Ubuntu for Open Science. I wanna thank you all very much, Dr. Pesic, Dr. Corley, Dr. Ravelli, Ms. Mafakwane, my colleague Meg, and of course, I want to thank uh, all the friends and colleagues who have joined online and have uh, spent uh, over two hours with us. And we will circulate the questions to the panelists for any additional comments, plus some of the wonderful comments that you have made. Thank you all very much. Looking forward to our next engagement with the Open Science Universe.